Thank you so much for joining us today, and please join me in wel welcoming our speaker, Pamela Parmal. Thank you, Kristen, and good morning, everyone. This morning, I'm talking about William Merritt Chase and clothing as depicted in his portraits, but I'm also going to take the subject a, a bit broader, and you'll see why as I move through the talk. Uh, first, though, when we look at the paintings of William Merritt Chase, we can't really help but be impressed by his love of textiles. Uh, it's clear from his depictions of his studio at 10th Street and many of his portraits, textiles really play a primary role in uh, these paintings. This painting in particular fascinates me with the range of textiles you see, uh, that yellow probably Chinese hanging in the background, a really fine Persian carpet uh, to its right, probably a kimono draped on the chair, another Chinese carpet on the floor. There's a real range of textile types um, that you see in the studio and in his paintings. Uh, when you look at Chase's costume, um, as depicted in mainly his portraits, you find the same love of cloth. And I think one of my favorite paintings, or actually pastel portraits, in the exhibition is this uh, painting titled Meditation. And it's a portrait of Chase's wife. And she's wearing a gray velvet um, kind of mantle or, or jacket. It's like she's just either come in from a walk outside or ready to go out. And the texture he creates with the pastels uh, is really extraordinary when you look at the painting. It looks just like a really rich, plush velvet. It's just a luscious painting. And I think Chase really um, enjoyed reproducing these textures, the luminosity uh, of textiles in doing his paintings. And I think this isn't surprising, uh, considering the painters he admired, like Velázquez and Van Dyck, who also really um, spent a lot of time and attention on the textiles you see in their portraits. Uh, I think in terms of the clothing he depicts, depicts, while it's very easy to often recognize the types of textiles he's displaying, the detail in the dress often fades away. And that's uh, one characteristic of Chase's work. And that becomes quite clear um, in this kind of fortuitous survival of the, the painting by Harriet Hubbard Ayer, along with a photograph of Harriet wearing the same dress. And it's very easy to see all the detail that's really missing from Chase's portrait uh, in the way he has handled the kind of black, this kind of black dress that just takes in all the light and you can't really see much that's going on. He's only heightened the detail in the sleeves and the bodice. Now Harriet um, is an interesting subject. She was actually from Chicago, married very well and became a very important socialite in the city of Chicago. She um, actually spent time in Paris, where, like many socialites in kind of Gilded Age America, she had her clothing designed by uh, Charles Frederick Worth, who was really the founder of the haute couture in Paris and the leader of fashion during uh, the later part of the 19th century. And the dress that she is wearing in both the portrait and the photograph is a Worth design. And for many women, the fact that she's able to wear worth is very key. So it's interesting that Chase's portrait really kind of obliterates the detail in the fact that it's a worth dress. That's very different from many of the other portrait painters um, that you find. Uh, Harriet is also interesting because in her biography written by her daughter, she writes a bit about Harriet's visits to Worth. And we get a sense of who Charles Frederick Worth was. Um, he really was a fashion dictator, in a sense. And he dictated more than just fashion and what dresses people should wear. Um, Harriet remarked on the fact that he also recommended her hairstyle. And he brought in a hairstylist. And they developed this hairstyle with kind of soft bangs in the front, curls in the back. And it was a hairstyle she she kept until she died. Um, so he had a real impact on the lives of his clients in, in more ways than just in their clothing itself. He was really guided, especially a lot of the Americans, um, on um, what to wear when, kind of the, the proper social um, uses of clothing, especially in Europe, which was a different environment for them. So it's interesting that Chase really doesn't take an interest in this kind of fashion, um, especially in uh, portraits that he decides to paint for himself. Uh, in some of his commissioned portraits, you see a little bit more um, of the interest in dress, and as well as in this pair of portraits, which I find a, a very interesting comparison. Um, both are of the same um, sitter, um, 
Mariette Cotton, who was part of New York society at the time. She summered in Newport. She was you know, very much a part of that high society uh, in New York. And uh, Chase painted two portraits of her. The one on the left is um, the first portrait he painted shortly after he met her. And again, he featured her with this kind of black dress where you really can't read detail. It just becomes a, a kind of a black hole in a sense um, that your eyes immediately go um, to the face of the sitter. And he really highlights the face of the sitter and the beautiful kind of still life of the rose on the table at the other side. The dress is kind of a foil for that. Um, on the portrait, on, the, on your right uh, is a very different kind of portrait and he spends a lot more attention on the fabrics on the dress. You can actually um, read that it's probably a, a taff, pink taffeta that's covered with a tulle. You can read the different trimmings on the different layers of the dress. There's much more detail that he goes into here. And I think um, scholars like Erica and others have often compared these two portraits to the different aspects of Marriott Cotton's life. Um, she was, while she was a socialite, she was also a successful portrait painter. And the painting on the left kind of refers to her status as this new, more independent woman, whereas the painting on the right um, really kind of maybe focuses more on her role as a socialite. And it's interesting that Chase de decided to paint these two portraits. They were not commissions. Uh, he painted them for himself. And in a sense, I see two different audiences for these portraits, one um, for his peers who can appreciate his handling of the paint and the control of the composition, which is the one on the left, and then the one on the right more for that high society audience who may come to him for portraits. Both were heavily shown in um, exhibitions of paintings, both in the States and Europe. Now, um, fashion in kind of Gilded Age New York and the role of fashion was something that was very important, especially to women who were a part of high society. And I want to just read a quote from Edith Wharton's book, A House of Mirth. Her heroine, Lily Bart, comments towards the beginning of a book. She's talking to Ned Silverton, her romantic interest throughout the book, and she says to him, your coat's a little shabby, but who cares? It doesn't keep people from asking you to dine. If I were shabby, no one would have me. A woman is asked out as much for her clothes as for herself, the clothes and the background, the frame, if you like. They don't make success, but they are a part of it. Who wants a dingy woman? We are expected to be pretty and well-dressed till we drop. So you can see she's kind of complaining about this, this position that women in society at the time were really put into uh, becoming the showcase for the husband's wealth. Um, so that's an important part of understanding kind of Gilded Age fashion. Now, actually, before I go on and talk more about women's dress in the Gilded Age, I do want to address men's fashion, um, because the 19th century is actually a really fascinating period in the development of men's wear. Um, prior to that, in the 18th century and um, earlier, men dressed as elaborately as women. Um, the more expensive your clothes, the more a sign it was of your wealth and position within the society. And I, one of my favorite pieces in the museum's collection is actually this man's sleeved waistcoat. It's actually a vest with sleeves. It would have been worn under a jacket. And it was made in about 1720s, the 1720s in England, and is a, a silk, what is known as a cloth of gold. It's covered with um, silk brocading and gold metallic yarns. So it would have been a very expensive, showy garment. And it was actually worn by a Boston man, Ebenezer Storer. Um, who was actually a merchant here in the city of Boston, a very successful merchant. And I think it's not the kind of clothing you see depicted in Copley paintings. Um, but it shows you that Boston merchants were very concerned with their wealth and their status. And it's not the only piece like this uh, worn in colonial Boston that we have in the collection. There are actually two fragments from uh, two other waistcoats that store wore, which are just quite as elaborate. Um, not quite with as much gold metallic thread. Um, so this idea of um, elaborate, lavish clothing was very much a part of the 18th century culture. Of course, this kind of changes during the, at the end of the century with the revolution in France. There's a kind of turning away um, from the French aristocracy, which kind of set the fashions during most of the 18th century, and more of a focus on Britain. And in Britain, there was always this push to get men to wear more wool, because wool was an important export uh, of Great Britain. So back until the seven, back to even the 17th century, um, 
the government and even the, the king was trying to get men to wear, wear, to wear more wool suits. But it's really in the beginning of the 19th century when you see uh, this wool suit being a, kind of adopted as a very fashionable type of garment. And I think a big influence is in that is the development of the dandy. And of course, the epitome of the dandy was Beau Brummel. And he was part of the Prince Regent's set um, during this early part of the 19th century. And he really was one of the people who popularized the three-piece man's dark wool suit. Uh, at this point, they were wearing black, um, dark browns, greens, blues, kind of a range of colors, but this deep dark wool kind of coupled with a, a sparkling white shirt and stock, um, which was tied around the neck. It was um, said that Brummel would spend hours trying to tie different knots around his neck to kind of you know, show off that um, pristine white linen against the dark suit. Um, of course, the quality of the cloth out of which the suit was made and the tailoring of the suit were also very important. And these become key elements in kind of defining uh, the well-dressed man, you know, until today. Um, this three-piece suit that really comes to fashion in the early 19th century, uh, men still wear to this day. And, and Brummel and his like are a, a important part of that. What's also interesting and important in the development of the man's suit is um, the rise of the Industrial Revolution, which made textiles much more affordable, created new machines for manufacturing clothing, like the sewing machine, um, you know, machine cutters. All of this went to make clothing much more affordable. And uh, ready to wear from men really develops in the 19th century. So this means that people across many social classes could afford to buy um, these men's suits. Um, another well, here, I'll just show you a, an advertisement from uh, 1865, which just shows a range of different styles of, of menswear. They all look very similar, but each one has a, a kind of different role in, the, light, in the, the day of a man. And another important aspect of ready-to-wear and the development of ready-to-wear is really the sizing, which um, standardizes during the 19th century. And much of that... Um, some of it, a lot of it actually happened here in the United States. Um, the US opened a bureau um, to control kind of, it's called the United States Army Clothing Establishment. And it was actually set up in 1812 and it was to control the making of men's uniforms, military uniforms. And they began to actually collect data on men's sizes. All of the measurements were kept. and. Um, really, probably after the Civil War, where they had built up such a huge database, they were able to standardize sizes for men, different sizes that would, you know, kind of fit most of the men uh, here in America. So with standardization of sizing, uh, cheaper fabrics, new manufacturing techniques, ready-to-wear for men really took off by the second half of the 19th century. Um, of course, those who could afford to, like... Um, the Baron de Montesquieu, who you see on the left, um, would still have their clothing handmade, and that continues today. Um, this idea of the dandy, the well-dressed aesthete, really continues through the 19th century, and um, uh, Montesquieu de Faisonsac really, um, really is the quintessential dandy of the late 19th century. Is a Frenchman, an aesthete, and um, those of you who have read Proust will recognize him. He was the inspiration for the character Charlus. Um, who is part of Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. Um, this is a, the painting that was painted by Whistler on the left, and the painting on the right is one you probably recognize. Um, it's Chase's portrait of Whistler, um, kind of, in a sense, satirizing Whistler's um, dandy kind of habits. And you see the, the paintings are, are quite similar in the way they're set up with that three-quarter view and the cane extended out in front of you. But both of them were this dark black, and especially um, the painting of um, Montesquieu, that white linen just really pops. Um, so that idea of the dandy, the dark clothing with the white linen, um, really lasts throughout the 19th century and even into the 20th, um, formal wear for men still looks very much like um, what Montesquieu Faisonzac is wearing. The black tie and tails still exists today. So this um, kind of democratization of fashion that happened with menswear um, really kind of creates a foil in a sense for the elaborate women's wear of the period. And I just included this um, Frith painting called A Private View of the Royal Academy. In this 
in this case, just to show you the black, the dark colors of menswear with their top hats, and you see how the bright colors worn by, the, by women were just really set off against that. Um, women now become the showcase for men's wealth in society, and that is one reason why in Gilded Age New York, um, women uh, and the being able to wear fashionable dress, one thing that was actually so important for women um, during that time. They became kind of emblematic of their husband's wealth and position in society. And I want to introduce you to um, Caroline Skerberhorn, uh, Webster Astor. She's the Mrs. Astor and really controlled society for much of the later part of the 19th century in New York. This portrait um, was painted by Carolus Durand, and I think if you think about Chase's work, there's much more definition going on here. You can really read what's going on uh, with her dress, um, although there's a lot of attention to, um, to the fabric, too. You know that this is a very heavy, rich silk satin, but you can now read the, the lace, all the embroidery down the front. All of these details are very clear and would have immediately marked this dress as something done by Charles Frederick Worth. He was very fond of this historicism in dress, and this was a very popular style of dress he did that looked back to kind of the 17th century cavalier style, and there are numerous examples, including one in the museum, in MFA Boston's collection. Um, but this portrait really kind of sets up Mrs. Astor as kind of the ruling uh, queen of New York society uh, at the time in terms of her pose and the clothing she wears. Um, it's really kind of the epitome of Mrs. Astor in high society. And I think Worth is really an important figure in all of this, so I want to spend some time talking about Worth. Um, he's also important as the father of haute couture. And I think this uh, portrait of Worth from kind of late in his life, uh, gives you a sense of the man. He actually considered himself a real artist. And he's depicted here kind of in the style of Rembrandt with his beret and his kind of, his fur overcoat and his like big artist bow tie. Um, he wasn't just a dressmaker. He was really an artist. And that's how he viewed himself throughout his career. So unlike uh, dressmakers who were working in Paris before Worth really came onto the scene, um, he really dictated fashion. He told women what they should wear. And prior to that, women would take buy their fabric, take it to the dressmaker, and then between the two of them, they would come up with the type of dress the women wanted to wear. Women had much more of a role uh, in designing their wardrobes if they worked with a dressmaker. Worth was very different. You went to Worth, you chose the design, and it was made up in your size. So very much the way the, the couture works um, to this day. Now, Worth was actually an Englishman, which is a little surprising. He was born in Lincolnshire and um, started out, I think, as a young man apprenticing in the printing business and really disliked it. Um, he wasn't happy at all. So he, I think at the age of 14, moved to London, where he began working with uh, dry goods firms in London. And it was at the dry goods firms where you bought the textiles you took to the dressmaker or the wools you took to the tailor. Um, they also supplied shawls and some um, mantles um, that women could wear that weren't kind of fit to the body. And he got his training in London, but then kind of soon realized Paris was really where things were at again. Um, fashion was really coming from the city of Paris, so um, I think before he reached the age of 20, he moved to Paris. And he began working, um, eventually he learned the language and eventually got a job with another dry goods firm, um, Gagelin Opigny, and it was one of the most luxurious dry goods uh, shops in Paris. And he quickly worked his way up the ladder and at the same time met his future wife, Marie, who was actually a, uh, worked in the store itself and, and would model some of the shawls and capes that were um, at the store. This is the period of the cashmere shawl, so you think of those big um, shawls that wrapped around the bodies. And Worth also, I'm not sure where, but developed an interest in dressmaking. I don't know how he learned, but he began designing garments for his wife to wear, which would show off these shawls and mantles. And clients, and actually the, the managers of Gagelin, began to take notice. And Worth was eventually given his own dressmaking shop uh, within uh, the Gagelin Enterprise, and became very successful and actually designed, I think, a court train that appeared in one of the um, uh, 
Paris exhibitions and um, gained an award. So he became quite successful and eventually kind of decided to go off on his own. So in 1858, with the support of a Swedish businessman, Otto Boberg, he opened Worth and Boberg and um, struggled for a little while, but with actually the help of his wife, Marie, uh, who had contacts um, through her work at Gagelin, um, came to the attention of a very fashionable woman in Paris at the time. And this is Pauline Metternich, who was the wife of the Austrian ambassador to, Par to France. And you can see from this portrait of Pauline by Degas, she was very much a woman who was a part of the kind of avant-garde in Paris at the time, and she wasn't afraid of experimenting with new things. And this portrait itself um, by Degas was actually not I don't, done by, um, with the sitter there, it was actually painted from a photograph. And it was this photograph, which is actually the visiting card of the ambassador and his wife. And you can see the liberty the artist has taken with the actual dress, which I think is interesting for those of us who use portraits and thinking about fashion. You need to be very cautious um, because he changes the color. He takes away the trim. He really makes some um, definite changes in the actual painting. Um, this dress is actually was designed by Charles Frederick Worth. And when um, Marie Worth actually approached Pauline um, with some of the sketches from Worth's studio, um, she actually decided that she would order two pieces, a day dress and an evening dress. And shortly um, after she received the clothes, she uh, wore the evening dress to one of the court balls and came to the attention of the Empress Eugenie, who decided she had to have a similar dress. So the Empress Eugenie began to patronize Worth. That meant all of the other ladies in the court began to patronize Worth. Other you know, royals throughout Europe and um, even the crown princess of Japan eventually became clients of Worth. So um, Metternich really did kind of launch Worth in his career. And I just wanted to read a quote um, about uh, Metternich that um, from Julian Osgood Field, who was a real kind of bon vivant at the time and wrote his uncensored recollections in 1924. She wrote of Metternich that she had that really rare gift, like poetry, music, cooking, and like them cannot be acquired, the sentiment de la toilette to a degree approaching genius, and could wear the most amazing dresses, both as regards material, making, and coloring, so exquisitely put together, so grouped that the effect was always charming. It was, of course, she who discovered at Gagelin in the Rue de Richelieu that young Englishman from Lincolnshire, Worth, and soon recognizing in him a fellow genius, took him up and made his fortune. So she's um, an important figure in his work, as I said, and just to show you a sketch survives of this day dress um, that's part of the Worth archive, and you can compare it to another portrait, photographic portrait of um, the princess. So she's, um, she is key, and Worth's salon um, becomes increasingly uh, important throughout the later part of the 19th century. Uh, he opens on the Rue de la Paix, which at that time was not really um, one of the most fashionable um, boulevards in the city, but soon uh, becomes that. And his salon eventually grows to um, so large that he's employing 2,000 women who and men who work in the shop, kind of making dresses for women. It, it becomes a huge, huge enterprise. And here, I just want to show you one of the salons in the shop um, where you can see models of some of the bodices for the dresses he made that a client could look at and decide which one she wanted to wear uh, and then have the, the dress actually made up. Um, so worst clientele, as I said, involved, there were many, many um, of the royals throughout Europe who became clients. Um, Americans also were very important clients of Worth. And when a client went to Worth's studio, they were often um, looked at the models to decide what they wanted to wear. Um, 
and this is where the terminology gets a little confusing, but models or mannequins, actually, women actually wearing the dresses would parade out and you could look at them and decide uh, what you wanted to wear. Worth, in a sense, is the first to create two collections a year that he would dress on models. Um, you would go to his studio, uh, the models would parade out and you would choose the garments you wanted. And this is actually how the couture industry worked into the early part of the 20th century. The elaborate runway shows we know today, are not they didn't really start until the, really the 1970s, 1980s is when the elaborate runway shows begin. Um, Worth was also a very interesting businessman because um, the dresses he designed, he would actually sell the patterns or what were called models, which makes um, the terminology even more confusing. He would sell them to department stores, which were really becoming popular at this time, uh, dressmaking establishments. So these, the dressmakers could actually copy the Worth designs. And by the kind of middle of the 20th century, the exportation of these French model designs from the couture houses was actually one of the leading exports in France. Um, so it was in a really important commodity were these dress patterns that were going all over the world, many to New York, where a lot of the ready-to-wear firms um, and department stores were buying them, advertising that they were making Worth's gowns for their, their clients. Um, so Worth is really key, um, very important in terms of the development of the, the history of fashion uh, during this time. And Americans, because of his um, kind of preeminence as uh, the leading designer in Paris, you know, often went to him and were guided by him in many different ways. And um, Worth, in return, actually liked his American clients. And according to Worth, um, he said, they have faith, figures, and francs. <laughs> he says, they have the faith to believe in me, figures I can put into shape, and francs to pay my bills. Yes, I like to dress Americans. Um, so um, they were very good clients. And it's um, noted that some women would buy up to 150 dresses a year. Um, from Worth and spend uh, between $400 a year to, you know, like twenty dollars or $24,000 a year. So, so at the time, that was really huge sums of money. And when you think of the social lives of many of these American women in Gilded Age New York, um, you can understand why um, they would need so many garments to get them through the year. Uh, women changed often during the day. Um, there were specific garments for different times of the day, specific garments for different activities. And of course, you wouldn't want to wear the same ball gown over and over again to the, the many events you went to throughout the year. And um, these garments were an important part of uh, the wardrobes. And women would you know, buy them from Worth. And by the end of the century, there were a number of other important couturiers who women were going to, Jacques Doucet, uh, Jean Paquin, who was the first really important female um, couturier who was working during the time. They were all um, had a place and could be found in the wardrobes of many of New York's Gilded Age women. And uh, you actually find many of these garments depicted in Chase's portraits. Um, he was clearly aware of, you know, what the proper garments for the different times of day. And I just wanted to kind of go through um, some of these garments and show you some of uh, Chase's portraits. Uh, on the left is uh, a kind of negligee dress, which was only, of course, worn uh, in the house probably early in the day. A very comfortable, loose style of dress, which would um, kind of lead the way into the fashions as they developed into the early part of the 20th century. Um, it is made by a house, A. Felix. Um, there were, in the 19th century, uh, dressmakers and uh, houses that specialized in different types of garments. Felix um, was a house that specialized in lingerie wear. And um, Jacques Doucet, before he became a couturier, his family firm also spent, specialized in kind of lingerie. And this is a garment that was actually worn by Caroline Astor, Mrs. Astor, and is in the Metropolitan Museum's collection. And it's really not that dissimilar from the dress you see in Chase's painting. Um, I think I am ready now. And you can see from the back, this kind of loose flowing train um, is really an, an 18th century influence, which is something you see often in worse work. And the tea, it, this develops into what becomes known as a tea gown, 
which is something many women adopted, especially for where during the day, sometimes when they were entertaining um, for different in the morning, they would wear these loose flowing gowns um, that um, I'll show you later become really interesting and important in the history of dress. They also, women were becoming a bit more active, so you needed um, suits which to go out walking in. Um, so these more tailored suits, um, this again based on 18th century models. Another Worth design, which I think was worn by one of the Hewitt sisters um, in New York. Uh, it has a kind of a jacket, 18th century inspired jacket, exposing a vest beneath and um, the linen and lace at the neck, all of this referring back to the 18th century and worse interest in that period in time. Um, so the walking garment, which um, you also see in tailor maids, there are more and more tailored garments um, that women are requesting. Uh, and tailors like Redfern, who was another Englishman working in Paris, were also very important during the period. Worth II had a tailoring shop. And here's a photo of a dress from about 1905 um, that would have been suitable for outdoors and walking. And I think this, you can look at um, Chase's portrait of Beatrice Clo Bachman uh, and see she's wearing a similar kind of outdoor um, jacket or tailor-made garment um, that um, she put on for going out of doors. There were also dresses that were worn for the afternoon. When you went out visiting, you would put on your afternoon dress. Um, in this case, it's a little bit more fitted to the body. Um, there's more lace, uh, but it still has long sleeves and the neckline is very well covered. For day wear, this would um, be very common. And then, of course, you needed a dinner dress that you would change into for dinner. And um, this, again, the, more of the arms are bare, and now the neckline is also um, bare. This is a, a wonderful ensemble from the museum's collection, and it was um, worn by Mrs. John Quincy Adams III. She was um, a very much a fashion plate here in the city of Boston. She and um, Mrs. Gardner were really uh, important clients at the House of Worth. Um, we have several examples of clothing from her collection and um, in the museum's um, collection. And this dress is really interesting because of the fabric out of it, which it was made. Worth was um, very important in, in a sense in reviving the silk industry in uh, France. During the um, first part of the century, cottons were really very important uh, in dress, this more empire style of dress, but silks become gradually more and more important. And Worth begins commissioning a lot of different textiles from a lot of the manufacturers in Lyon. And the textile out of which this dress is made out of is um, patterned with tulips. And it's a, a really um, famous style that Worth often um, used in many of his costumes. You see it in, in different garments. So this was classic dinner dress. And then of course you need the evening dress if you were going out at night, which was the kind of the most bare uh, of all the garments, um, exposing both the um, upper neck and the arms. And this uh, dress you see on the left, another Worth gown, was again worn by one of the Hewitt sisters. And it's this decoration of the garments with um, softly flowing fabrics, tools, um, very sheer silks was very popular in the period, especially for uh, younger women, and then trimmed with these silk flowers. And you see a chase painting on the right of Mrs. Cook and her daughters, and she wears a, a similar dress, although probably a, a more like a, a dinner dress, which is um, not quite as bare um, as the, the evening dress. But it too incorporates the same um, soft fabrics and flowers that you see in many of these other Worth designs. Uh, and then another evening dress, um, this one slightly later dating to around 1900. And just to show you that there were also many dressmakers in New York at this period who were making garments. And even someone like Carolyn Skirmerhorn Astor, this was her dress. And even she would frequent some of the more popular dressmakers that had established themselves in the city of New York. Um, so you could actually buy these fine designs in New York. And it was a conscious choice of these women to go outside of New York and, and buy in Paris. Um, by the late 19th century, New York was becoming 
very much a place where you could acquire fashionable garments. And many of you may be familiar with the Ladies' Mile, which was a um, section of, I guess, Sixth Avenue where many of the department stores established themselves early on. There were also a lot of dressmakers in that area, and um, people could go and, and shop in these stores. And department stores are something also quite new to this period and very important because it brought together all of the goods that you used to have to go to a variety of specialty stores. It brought it all together under one, you know, one price. There was no haggling. Um, in the past, women would go to stores and you would have to kind of bargain about the prices. With the department stores, it was a set price and you paid the price. That was something that was very different in the period. And a lot of people actually appreciated that, to have that um, firm pricing on the objects. Plus, just the plethora of goods that were available to people in the department stores. They became like these wonderlands. Um, I think Lord & Taylor was the first department store to actually have an elevator, and that was exciting for many people. They would often just go to ride up and down <laughs> in the elevator. Um, so they, they were really these fantasy worlds for many people, but made fashionable dress um, really accessible to people. They could come and um, acquire what they could. Um, this was especially with the men's ready-to-wear, which was accessible. Most of the department stores actually had dressmaking salons where you could um, have dresses made at lower prices. And also by the end of the 19th century, you were really beginning to see um, women's ready to wear uh, begin to develop. It starts, as I said, with Worth um, and the stores, the dry goods stores like Gagelin, um, selling uh, women's kind of capes and mantles, which were not, you know, closely fit to the body, so you could make them kind of one size fits all. Um, but as time progresses, um, different garments become machine made, like a woman's shirt waist, which I'll, I'll show you as we go on. So in New York, this kind of fashion you see here is really um, accessible to many at, at different levels of society. And then just to show you. Um, Another portrait by Chase, which I think is um, quite interesting. And she's wearing a, a very similar garment to the dress you see on the left, um, Content Johnson. Um, but I think this is a, a commissioned portrait that Chase you know, painted for the sitter. And I imagine that she really insisted that he depict her dress as accurately as possible to show her as this you know, fashionable woman in the city of Boston. Um, but I think she kind of fades away in a sense. Her face fades away and the dress and the, all the, the frilly ruffles and embroideries really begin to dominate. Um, it's, a, it's a very different feeling than uh, some of the other portraits which um, Chase decided to paint really um, on his own and not on commission. And I think you can see that when you compare this portrait of uh, Mrs. C, uh, who's also wearing evening dress with that of uh, Miss J. And in the portrait of Minnie Clark, she's wearing just a simple white dress and her face just pops forward. Um, they're very different in feeling, uh, these two portraits. And I think you know, that was part of Chase's genius and his interest in portraying this new woman um, who really confronts the viewer in a way that um, previous portrait painters uh, did not. And Minnie Clark um, is actually an interesting subject. Chase, um, when he was first introduced to her, um, liked her immediately. And he said of her that, as she arose gracefully and stood smiling before me, I knew at once that fortune had sent me the very subject I had long hoped to find, a perfect type of American womanhood a clear-cut, classic face with splendid profile, a steadfast expression of sweetness, loveliness, womanliness, and above all else, dignity and simplicity. So Minnie um, is actually a subject in many of uh, Chase's paintings. And um, she was also actually probably the first um, professional model uh, for painters and illustrators in New York. And she actually sat for many different artists, uh, including the illustrator Charles Dana Gibson. And I think many of you have heard of the Gibson girl. And Minnie is said to have been one of the, the models who kind of the prototypes for the Gibson girl. And Gibson describes her as 
She is simply all woman in one and can laugh or cry, be awkward or graceful, look stupid, pensive, amused, interested or clever, and all at will. She's really the perfect cipher, the perfect model. And he, he talked about her in an 1894 um, article in the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. So um, this connection to uh, Miss Clark in both Chase's work and Gibson's work is really um, interesting. Both of them are looking for this kind of iconic uh, American women that develops in the, the later part of the 19th century. And the Gibson girl, in a sense, became, becomes the, the, the stand-in for this woman. Um, she's very tall, athletic, um, kind of commanding presence. And she becomes a feature of advertising, in particular, for at least 20 years. And kind of Gibson uses her a lot in his illustrations. And this is a kind of a satirical illustration. Um, here she is playing golf, and she cries four, and it says, the American girl to all the world. It's almost like, watch out, here she comes, um, in a sense. A, she appears you know, really quite often and is, is a big part of um, illustration during this period. And this kind of this tall, athletic figure um, is, uh, is important and I think really uh, key to understanding this, this new women, woman that you see in Chase's paintings and also in the way fashion develops in the later part of the 19th century into the 20th century. Because as women are no longer um, kind of kept in the home in a sense, but are able to go out freely, uh, participate in different sports, um, new garments are developed for uh, women to wear. And here you see advertisements for um, golf costume, a yachting costume, um, as well as tennis dresses from a, a slightly earlier period. So there's this interest in um, kind of developing new and different dresses for um, women and in this period. Um, also this idea of a uh, woman outside on her own, you see often in Chase's paintings, um, such as the end of the season where a lone woman sits kind of at the beach, um, you know, wearing one of these outdoor costumes. Um, there's something um, about this, this new, stronger, independent woman that comes through in this painting and, and much of the work of Chase. Um, and also another aspect of this kind of sense of reform and change that is happening during this period. And it's not only in, there is a, this push for dress reform, a loosening up of clothing. Um, women in, are pushing for this. Um, through, there are different um, segments of dress reform. There's one, um, the people who are reforming dress for health reasons. Women shouldn't be wearing corsets, such tight corsets, they should be wearing looser clothes. Um, and there's also the dress reformers, kind of political dress reformers, the bloomer crowd, who are wearing kind of pants, which become um, associated with the suffragettes, but are really just a form of bicycle clothing. So there are different reform movements. And I think one of the most interesting as applied to Chase and his work is the kind of artistic or aesthetic dress reform movement, which is something that begins uh, in England with the pre-Raphaelites um, and the work of Gabriel Rossetti and um, even William Morris, who are begin designing clothing for the women in their family that's more loosely fitted, more comfortable. And many of the prototypes they're looking to is medieval dress, a very loose kind of fluid clothing um, that they're designing for their women. And actually, I want to go back to the Frith painting, which is actually a commentary, a kind of satire about um, the aesthetic dress. and. It, um, in the foreground, you actually see women wearing examples of aesthetic dress. The three, two women on the left and the child are in aesthetic dress. It's a um, much looser style of dress. And if you compare it to the seated figure in the center with this very tight bodice worn over a corset, you can see it is um, you know, much looser in feeling, uh, more draped style. And the woman on the right in the pink also wears this kind of aesthetic dress. You see this ruching on the sleeve is very characteristic of a lot of the aesthetic dress styles. And of course, she is looking at Oscar Wilde, who is at the Royal Academy looking at the paintings. Um, and Oscar Wilde actually, he did a tour, a lecture tour in the United States in um, 1882 and really talked to, um, about this aesthetic reform. Uh, dress was actually a part of what he was interested in. 
I think he had a velvet um, suit made up with breeches and a jacket, um, kind of looking back to the 18th century, and he wore that on his tour. Um, and actually, the sunflower worn by the women in green is also a reference to um, Oscar Wilde. So this form of dress really um, you know, starts in London, but actually does come um, to the US. And the circle that Chase moved in, I think, was very much aware of these currents uh, and these changes. And I think several of the portraits you see in the exhibition and in Chase's work, um, women are actually wearing uh, aesthetic dress in these paintings. In the US, I think most of the women who adopted it didn't necessarily go outdoors, but wore aesthetic dress in the home. I think it's kind of um, the tea gown and the aesthetic dress can kind of be um, considered one in the same. And I think one of the most beautiful portraits in the show is this portrait of Dora Wheeler, who I believe really is wearing aesthetic dress and not fashionable dress. And one reason for that is if you look at the upper body, you can see there's a very loose feel to it. There's gathering um, up on the sleeve right here. Um, which is very different than the cut of fashionable dress at this time. And as working with her mother at Associated Artis Artists, doing aesthetic period interiors, it, it really is not surprising um, that she would be someone who would um, wear aesthetic dress at, in a portrait by Chase. Um, I think they were very much aware of what they were doing, conscious of it. And just to kind of show you that I'm not just making this up, um, I wanted to show you uh, two examples of aesthetic dress that were produced by Liberty and Company, um, who were kind of flourishing during this period and opened their own department to make dress. And you see a kind of a tea gown in the center, which um, has very similar lines to the dress that Dora Wheeler wears in her portrait, um, even you know, lined with fur along the center. And then another dress that could have been worn outdoors, um, maybe similar to those in the Frith painting. And the ruching here in the kind of in the waistline, which is so characteristic of aesthetic dress of the period, gives it that soft kind of fit that you see. Um, and so that's because of these two garments, I'm, I'm fairly certain Dora is wearing a, a kind of aesthetic dress in her portrait. Uh, another aspect of aesthetic dress was really the interest in um, clothing and textiles of other cultures and the idea of Japanese Japanese garments, Chinese garments, and Worth, um, or not Worth, but Liberty actually sold uh, Japanese Chinese garments in their store. We have a, a Chinese women's short robe in the collection, which actually has a label on it that says, you know, from Liberty and Company. So we know they were selling these garments um, at Liberty, and you could buy them there. And I think they're... Um, this, this painting in particular intrigued me. Um, in particular because of the waistcoat she's wearing. She's wearing a, a, you know, a very fashionable dress with the, the big sleeves, which is characteristic of you know, the mid-1890s. But it, this, um, the collar here and the jacket you see, or this um, gold, what I think is embroidery you see at the shoulder, there are these kind of chunky gold buttons that you see here. Um, I think she's actually wearing over her dress a Turkish vest, similar to this one which is in the museum's collection. So this idea of combining fashionable dress with this more um, kind of ethnic dress uh, is something I think Chase was doing and I think you see in more artistic kind of dress of the period. Um, just a kind of a little aside, this continues into the you know, 20th century, um, more bohemian types continue to wear dress from other cultures and we have a picture uh, in our archive of Miss Elizabeth Day McCormick. Um, some of you know she was actually a patron of the department. She donated about 5,000 textiles and costumes to the museum in the 1940s, but was collecting th through the 30s and 40s. And there's a picture of her, this little bird-like woman wearing this little Persian vest um, to one of the openings here at the museum. So this idea of um, artistic people wearing um, costumes like this is something that continues on. Um, and you see it starting here in the 1890s. Um, also the use of uh, Japanese kimono in many of Chase's paintings. You, you see that over and over again. Um, this portrait is actually quite interesting. Uh, it shows what looks like a Chinese kimono, but um, in looking at it closely and more pointed out that it's really not a kimono. Um, the cut of it is different. The sleeve 
is um, cut differently. It's a little bit more full. It's not quite a kimono. And I think what you're actually looking at is a garment um, not dissimilar from the dressing gown you see on the right, which is also in the museum's collection. And I think the, the Japanese themselves understood that people in the West were fascinated with their clothing. So they began to make garments in the style of the West, which is what you see here. It's a pink embroidered dressing robe that was actually sold at the Takashimaya department store in Japan uh, and made for a Western client. Um, so even the Japanese are responding to this, friend, this trend and, and making garments, which I think it's the garment you see on the left in Chase's painting um, is what you're seeing here. Um, so this idea of aesthetic dress, um, the loosening up of forms, um, is key uh, to further trends uh, in fashion. Um, and you see that, that plus the... Um, the interest in more athletic clothing, uh, the more active woman. By the 1912, um, and especially into the 20s, you see a real change in um, the fashionable silhouette. Um, corsets are banned by that time, and women are wearing these kind of loose-fitting clothes. And I think it's really this, um, the idea, the transition between the society um, women like Caroline Aster, who you see on the left again, and um, someone like Lydia Emmett Field, this new woman who is at kind of the forefront of that change. And I think Chase's portraits really um, show us that change and point us in the direction. Um, and I really hate to kind of generalize and, and simplify what's going on with changes in fashion, but I think the change from the clothing of Caroline that you see here in these portraits um, to what you see women wearing in the 19 teens and 20s um, really reflects that growing independence of women um, in, in fashion and you know, with, ch with Chase so wonderfully reflects in his paintings. And I'm gonna kind of just leave you with this pairing, which I think um, it's kind of clear why. <laughs> Um, the two dresses are very similar, but they're handled very differently by the artists. But even more important than that, I think, is the way in which the painters handled the sitters. Mrs. Astor, who was you know, such a dominant force uh, in society in the later part of the 19th century, she kind of looks away from us. She has this kind of demure, demure pose, which she certainly did not you know, have in real life. Um, but Lydia Field um, Emmett, you know, looks right at us in a sense. She has a more defiant, defiant posture and really typifies this kind of new women um, emerging from Chase's paintings and in society. So I'm gonna finish there and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, if you have them. Yes. Yes, corsets were laced, so you could um, you could lace them as tight as possible. And I think it probably depended on the woman how tight, but you really wanted to create that real hourglass silhouette, kind of pull in the, the waist and uplift the chest. That was very much a part of the fashion. And the corset shapes actually changed, you know, through the 19th century. Um, so the body kind of takes on different, different positions. Um, a lot of this period, you have this real S kind of curve that is popular. Yes. I have a question about, um, you talked about they had the, the morning dress, the afternoon dress, the yes. dinner dress, and the, as, these, as these styles became looser fitting, did that sort of meld into fewer times they were changing during the day? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the last part? Did, it, did they um, start to change less, you know, that the dinner dress melded into the evening dress so they were changing less often and that kind of... Um, change in style as opposed to changing like five or six times a day where they were dressed as serving more purposes in a day than just one meal or two hour period? Um, I, I'm sh I don't know if I get the questions. Women did change, you know, you change for dinner. If they were going out for a ball, you know, they would change for ball. They would, you know, they would definitely change like throughout the day. That continued despite the style changing. Did the... That, conti that, that idea of changing um, frequently. No, it, it still continues. I mean, we still dress differently if we're going out to a party or, you know, but not to the extent it was here. 
Yes. What about the undergarments for these dresses? Did that have to change, and how, how did it change? I don't think, you know, during the day it changed that much. Of course, with the tea gown and at home, you know, you could wear something simpler, maybe not even a corset. But throughout the day, whenever you went in, out in public, you definitely had your corset on, you had all of that. So the heavy boning and the whale Yes. Um, well, they were using steel boning at this point, but yes, definitely. That's what gives you that solid kind of shape. You, you use the term aesthetic dress. What did you mean by that, the aesthetic dress? It's kind of a, the aesthetic movement is a kind of a, it was developed in Britain in reaction to the industrial kind of revolution and the kind of design. There was a lack of emphasis in design in many of the industrial products. So people like William Morris, um, John Ruskin, um, started this movement to improve design. Um, and some people refer to that as kind of aesthetic, artistic in dress, you see it. There's a microphone. In a lot of these paintings, you've explained how the women uh, with their expensive gowns, like in that art gallery opening, were the accessories, you know, for the men, for their husbands to show off their wealth. But aren't they really accessories for the artists? Because the artists are also saying, I know these kinds of women, I can attract these kinds of women, I can create and control these kinds of, of women, not unlike Mr. Worth. So the, the artist isn't that really benign no. in this situation. No, the artist is not benign, and that's something I've been becoming more and more aware of, um, that you know, an artist like Chase, um, if you want a detailed portrait like the one by Carolus Duran that Mrs. Astor had, you didn't go to Chase. You were subservient to his kind of tastes in a way that you weren't to some of the other artists. So you had to make the choice who you went to. Um, but they did control um, what was going on. What about Boston? You mentioned Paris, you mentioned New York. Um, when does Boston come on the scene? And oh, Boston's always been on the scene, actually. Because we're talking about Chase, I really wanted to focus on New York. Um, but during the 19th century, Boston was a very fashionable city. And many women in Boston were going to um, Paris to have dresses made. Um, Fanny Crowninshield Adams, who I mentioned uh, in the talk, actually started having her clothing made uh, in Paris in the 1860s, 1870s, when she was a young girl. Her family would take her to Worth. Um, in the Amory, one of the Amorys who left a diary um, talks about wanting to take her daughters to Paris to make sure they're dressed properly. So this attitude was very much a part of Boston. Some reason it all changes in the early 19th century, and I have yet to really figure out why. Um, but uh, we have many Paris design garments in the collection. After about after the World War I, it just there's not much in the city anymore. Women aren't just not going to Paris anymore. So. Hi, are we to assume that the garments were owned by the women? I've never been, never been able to sort out in a portrait if they are props provided by the artist or actually owned by yeah, the Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, and it's, it is actually hard to know. Um, I'm, I'm thinking a lot of these garments were actually owned by the women. Um, the portrait of Mrs. Um, Ayer and the photograph of Mrs. Ayer wearing the same garment that survives. Um, the portrait of Miss J, there's actually a photograph of her wearing that dress. So, so we do know that um, some of the garments were owned by the women. Um, I don't know the woman who was wearing the Turkish vest. Is that something she owned or is that something that Chase put on her? You know, that we just don't know. Um, Copley, I'm more familiar with the 18th century, but Copley often just draped women in fabric and depicted them that way. Um, and several of his subjects are wearing the same dress. So it's, it's very difficult to know. Hi, um, I'm very interested in what you said about the men. And you showed that very elaborate um, kind of garment with all the gold and stuff. Yes. And then and then it seems such an abrupt change to the, to the almost sort of mono garment that they, I mean, there were subtle differences, but 
basically. Yeah, there, it, it really is a f rather abrupt change. Um, by the end of the 18th century, you do have an interest in France and Anglomania, all things kind of English. So you begin to see this more somber kind of English style of dress introduced into France. So they're kind of um, working their way towards it, but I think the French Revolution changes that happen really accelerate the change. Um, so that is one reason why um, you see that Beau Brummel suit. There's also a reaction against the French fop in England too. Um, so um, Charles James Fox, and there are some people who are still sporting very fancy clothes at the end of the 18th century, but there's a, a reaction against that with this darker suit. Uh, you kind of alluded to this when you started talking about the advent of department stores. Yes. But could you comment on kind of the breakdown of dress as a strong class signifier? Dress as a? Strong class signifier. In terms of menswear or? Or men's and women's, really. Men's, yeah. Um, well, it's always been, uh, and I think it still is today, only... Um, Today, you have to be more knowledgeable about fabrics and cut. Um, you know, men all wear the same kind of suit, but you can tell, you know, like I can tell immediately if something is handmade or, you know, by the way it's stitched or something. There are these, these more subtle signifiers um, that happen today that place you on a certain level of wealth or in society. Also, um, people who know how to wear the right dress at the right time. I think there's that wonderful scene in um, the Philadelphia story when um, Catherine Hepburn's fiance comes, they're gonna go riding, and he has this new riding ensemble and she immediately throws him down in the dirt and starts to dirty his boots. Um, because if you were really of the right class, you would have you know, dirty boots, you wouldn't have something brand new. So there are always these subtle signifiers. Um, before the Industrial Revolution, it was just much more obvious because only the very wealthy could afford these lavish garments like the waistcoat I showed you that was worn by Ebenezer Storer. Um, during the 19th century, it becomes much more subtle. Is that anyone else? I was wondering, how do they clean these garments, <laughs> or do they just throw them out after a year and get new ones? Well, I think one, one stock answer is this is one reason why linen was so important. Um, underneath um, all of these garments, um, both men and women wore linen or cotton undergarments. And those were the clothes that came in contact with the body. And those were the garments that were more easily washed. Um, so the man's white shirt, this is one reason why that white brightness was so important, because it showed really cleanliness. Women over the, under the corsets wore um, a, a white cotton undergarment that was a, a kind of longish, um, covered the upper, covered the, uh, to the upper part of the, the leg. Um, and then they also wore a garment a corset cover over the corset, so there were and petticoats, so there were layers of cotton undergarments under women's clothing. Um, if you got a stain or a spot on something, they did have basic kind of understood basic dry cleaning. They knew a specific, you know, something a chemical would remove a stain. So there there were different ways of cleaning that they did understand, but it was that linen undergarment that was the key. Do you think that it's any symbolism to the fact that Mrs. Astor has one glove on? That I'm not sure. <laughs> I did notice that, but I'm not completely sure what that means. No clue. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. Could you yes. speak a little bit as to how you care for these costumes and garments? I mean, obviously, they don't get sent out to our cleaner. Um, I'm assuming that they're not hung in many cases because that would put strain on them. But if you could just comment, it would be very interesting, actually, for someone to do a little tour mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Um, actually, a lot of the garments are still hung uh, if they're strong enough um, and can support themselves. We have, you know, heavily padded hangers, um, so there's all they're not just resting on one wooden you know, bar, the whole shoulder area is supported. Some of them are also supported at the waist uh, to keep them up. And um, the garments, we really tend to lay flat because that's not always the best way either. They can get crushed in drawers and things. Our garments that um, could easily be distorted if they were hung, like knit garments um, or garments cut on the bias. 
um, a lot of these are stored flat, either in boxes or in big drawers. So that's how we take care of it. And it's a very, yes. Yes, there's, you know, between, if, if we do have to stack things, there's acid-free tissue between them. The boxes are all acid-free cardboard, um, and the environment is kept very clean um, and, you know, the right temperature to control. Um, and, you know, we, if you keep it kind of cold enough and um, not too damp, you can help retard any bugs or anything like that. So we very carefully monitor the temperature and humidity. Since I'm actually involved in trying to deal with some of this in our historic society, I'm mm -hmm. just curious, on items that really are dirty and do need cleaning, is there a specific reference that one can go to? Can one contact the museum? I think you could look on the museum's website. There is a site called, um, a section called Cameo, which was put together by our conservation department, and there may be some advice there. Um, if you can't find it there, you can contact me and I can put you in touch with our conservators and they can let you know. Before anything goes into our storage, it's very carefully vacuumed um, and looked at for any kind of insect activity or, or whatever. So even before it gets into storage, it's, it's, we make it as clean as possible. I'm just curious because these portraits are of wealthy women yes. and people who can afford this. Right. What was everyone else wearing? Um, it was... This is one, I know I mentioned the shirtwaist kind of in passing, um, but there were dressmakers who were making, you know, kind of simple dresses, simple garments for people who couldn't afford these more lavish garments. Um, the styles were, you know, kind of similar actually, um, but they were just made out of much more cheap, cheaper materials um, and maybe less fabric, less ornament in some time. And, but the styles were fairly similar. Is there any sense that you will bring out some of these wonderful garments and maybe display them near the paintings that are similar? Uh, I wasn't aware of the scope of mm -hmm. what you had, and mm -hmm. I would dearly love to see it now. Yeah, we're, are you we're planning actually, something? I mean, there are there are different projects being discussed right now. One of which may you know do just that. So you'll have to stay tuned. <laughs> thank you so much, Pam, and thank right. you so much for coming thank today. You.